me show you in a brief PowerPoint slide how the audit works. The audit is shown in this green box down here on the legend. Uh, it's a valuable add-on to, uh, to every index and graph page of a report. Gives you a very quick glance overall summary for every page. Uh, you're going to see a count of all the features on the page. There's 12 features on this one. And how many of them are within the passing criteria? How many of them are in between the green and the red zone? and how many of them are failing or beyond the red zone. Uh, in this particular example, we see 11 of 12 are passing, 12 has failed, or in between in the yellow zone. Um, and just point out one last area here that the legend is pointing out that the area that it is passing or failing them on is the specification limit. And I'll go ahead and magnify that in the next slide. Just a larger image of the same without the text there. You can read it on the last slide. So we have a spec limit range and a little bit clearer percentages now next to the uh, next to those integers. You can read those a little bit better. 91.67 percent, zero, and 8.33 percent for the total. And then another quick example of that out of a 14 features on a page, you can see by range specification, six are passing and eight are in between passing failing. Zero failed in this example. Okay, now let me go ahead and give some examples of that in live QDM. Uh, seen in this report, we have a, we have a legend on the index page. Um, it's set to the uh, spec limit, and we don't have the audit turned on. We go through any number of pages and just see what the color um, alarm settings are by spec limit and what features are on that page. However, once we once we click on the edit menu and in view area, we can add the audit to the uh, to the legend page. Now, many quickly at a glance instead of determining how many we just know the total count for that page. We don't have to worry about red flyers or anything like that for that calculation within your own head. This last page, we've got a passing seven and five and eleven and one, like in the original case. This is really easy to change by other means from spec samples. Range may all be useful. Change your display settings and pull down the criteria by the index chart indicator, and voila. Now you've got a totally different audit. So if, if you would like the audit for the entire report, if you would like to know how many features passed versus uh, yellow zone versus the red, you could uh, you could see that on the index page because there, if you have all the features shown on the index page, then you can um, you can get an audit for the entire report right on the index page. Total number of features that passed, failed, um, and also the count of the total number of features. Fantastic. Um. All right. Um, do we have any specific questions on this feature? Fantastic. Okay. 
see if I can't clean this up a little bit for you. All right, now into the uh, statistics chart information. Um, this is a, a tabular type of chart that was developed um, to give you your you know small sample analysis um, between zero and ten samples. Gives you the raw data deviations along with your basic statistics. Um, I've broken this down for you in four areas. Um, seeing this green box here, we've got the, a description shown as well as the name of the feature and the nominal value. Um, and within this, the second green box here, we've got these. Uh, these four rows are the um, the index number of these samples because um, I've got a 30 sample data set in this in this screen. Um, are looking at the first 10, and then the actual raw data for the 10 for the x-axis, the y-axis, and then the z-axis. Um, in this brief column here, it's uh, just kind of a footnote, but uh, it tells you what side of the body coordinate system you're on. It'll be, it'll say center if your y coordinate is 0.0. .0. It's going to say left if you're, uh, if you have a negative y nominal. It's going to say right if you have a positive y nominal for all your features. Um, but more importantly, you have your uh, your last section here with all your statistics, your spec limits, your number of samples, uh, your six sigma, your range and your capability indexes, along with your x-bar mean. Uh, but don't forget the most important part of this, um, this type of chart. You're actually color coding it just like we were seeing in the, uh, in the uh, last example there. Um, we have the color coding on the legend here uh, by a specified criteria. Um, we have the green designation for all the samples that are within the criteria. We have a red designation seen here in all the samples in this row for all the samples that are out of the criteria. And we have a yellow designation for, for a reasonable sample that's between those criteria. And let me show you just a couple of setups for that. So for all the other charts that you have used, uh, this is the only chart that contains uh, real actual measured values. Uh, all the other charts are some form of a trend chart or a tabular chart of the statistics. This, is, this chart allows you to really display the measured values from your CMM or from your inspection device. In a, in a nominal base mode or on a zero base mode, which is uh, deviation. So, uh, but it doesn't work for very large sets of samples. If you get large sets of samples, you might still want to use a trend type of chart. But if it is, uh, you're using anything less than 10, uh, then there is a way to display all the 10 measured values for each one of your points and they can be merged for X, Y, and Z so it can be grouped and shown in one little table. And Jamie will now show how to uh, switch these settings on. Yeah, um, I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, in this example, these um, these tables are merged by X, Y, and Z, or in some case, you know, an extra feature or two for uh, for holes. Um, in this statistics chart, I've got basically everything turned on to show you as much as possible in the first example. Um, but you can take the take off the description and change that out for the nominal position of the feature um, or leave that off. You don't have to have the direction turned on if that's not going to be helpful. Um, you can ignore the sample size. You can change this to the last 10 deviations, so this index number is going to, uh, if I leave the index number turned on, it'll reflect 21 through 30 once I update that in just a second. See there, nominal position, 
and um, or you can set this up for your last six samples if you're um, just going to treat this like a, a PPAP um, a PPAP event. All right. So this is a very common report uh, on, on a PPAP study. You wanted to display the, the six, last six samples or six samples worth of data. And the, you want to really show the measured values in your report. Uh, this chart could be a good, uh, good choice for those type of reporting. And, and the color coding basically highlights, based on the spec limit, whether the parts are in spec or whether that particular feature, that value is out of fact, or is it using uh, more than 75% of the tolerance, but not all the way up to 100%. And that's what the yellow, um, yellow means. It basically kind of, uh, uh, it's, it's not out of spec, but it's using more than 75% of the spec limits. So, uh, so just by a quick browse through, you can look at all your measured values and uh, see which one failed. Uh, based on the samples uh, that were measured. Uh, there's also an option, Jamie will show you, instead of the index numbers, you can put the, the date and time, right, Jamie? Or the, yep. the, the date and time um, so that uh, you can look at the, uh, the samples based on the date and time of measure. Yep, that is, uh, that is actually our newest uh, enhancement for that, isn't it, Sigu? Yeah. That date and time is new flavor for the statistics charts. So now on the top column, it's showing the date of measurement for each one of the samples. Um, Let me zoom in on that a little bit. Let's do a zoom in page. Do we have any questions on that? Okay. Now we're going to show you importing match data by its location. Um, I consider this to be something we had on, uh, you know, everybody's wish list for a long time, or at least anybody in any quality uh, environment has wanted to be in do this and we finally got it. So um, what we're allowed to do now is import some data that doesn't have the same exact feature name that the GDNT, the CMM called out um, and match it up to feature names at uh, a comparable location uh, without the same, without the exact same feature names. Say uh, an LMI or a um, uh, red light scanning uh, inspection was done on the same type of part, but you don't have uh, you don't have the exact uh, feature names that were that are expected in your measurement plan. Just whatever the uh, whatever that inspector decided to call those, or the software might have auto generated for them. Uh, so now we've got a solution to that, and we're going to go into that. One one uh, use case is uh, sometimes you created a template but you're getting some data from your supplier, but they didn't measure exactly where, where you needed them to be. They measured a little bit off from where the measurements are. You could option to replace the data in your template, even though the measurements were not measured or, or not named the same, because typically when you get another data set from the supplier, they may not name it correctly. We now have an option so you can match them by location. Um, so that you could replace the data correctly, even if it's coming from a different source. Right. Um, that's exactly what I was going to show in this in this screen here. That in, in this bubble, letter A, uh, we're showing one chart is pointing to the CMM the CMM chart. So this is before we want to add any additional information. Um, and you see the leader line is is dropped a little bit lower than the information that. Um, that we may want to try and replace that with. Um, this leader line is from from this call out um, on letter B, 
and it has instead of D12 as a feature name, it has a six letter, a six number string, uh, completely different. But we're going to go ahead and uh, try to use that and call it in this um, hypothetical light scanning feature that's about four millimeters away from from the CMM feature. So what we do is we go into our preferences and we set up a target window size. Um, the default is shown here is two next to this arrow from, from letter A. Um, I'll go ahead and run through this live and I'll change that target window size to at least a four if I want to get if I want to get that previous information. And then the last step is to go ahead and import the data by location. We'll, um, we'll press the pull down from import data to see if there's more than one data set. And we'll replace the data set while checking replace data by location. It's really easy. In this screen right before we get into it live, we'll see in this example, this is the CMM report where only Y value had some variation. X and Z were pretty much a flat line at zero. But we want to import the other data set and replace this data if, if it's larger. I didn't mean if it's larger, but um, we want to replace that data within the target window size. And in the next screen, what, what the actual result is, it replaced the data on the x and the z-axis with quite a bit of variation there. And here's a more enhanced uh, up-close up view of the result from uh, that's pasted in the PowerPoint here. Um, it gives you a good solution. You don't have to make more than one report and try to correlate everything without, without the same name. I'll go ahead and run into that um, <coughs> get into that live here. Okay. And I'm going to scroll through a couple of pages just to find a certain feature I know. Uh, D14 here is one that is, when I import some new data, it's going to be about four, be, between three and four millimeters away um, from the CMM data. So now I'm, go, I'm ready to pull up my preferences and change that target window size. I can go all the way up to a target window size of 10. And that will be a 3D distance from the nominals in the original report. Now I'm ready to import the data. I've selected the file name and the file type, and now I'm ready. Okay, I've just got one data set to try and replace with. I'll select data by location and say OK. Watch these features here now. That was quick. This can be done over and over again. Uh, I, I've experimented around with this, and it's 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 pretty cool. I think so we've got more more updates we can show. But I mean, just playing around with this window size and bigger and bigger groups of data. Do you have any questions on this? Okay, um, now we're going to talk about the CPK, the seven cases for calculating. What we did was identified um, several cases. Um, we identified several cases 
that are um, outside of the normal um, bilateral tolerance zone. Um, previously, the software always treated um, doing this calculation as what we call what we now call case one, where um, every where the tolerances are exactly um, they're exactly centered around, you know, you have a nominal and it's like plus or minus one and plus or minus two. Well, now we can go ahead and set six other cases plus the original to whatever your process actually matches. Just a moment. True position is one of those common attributes where uh, you're actually going to set an a lower spec limit to be the same as a nominal target. And in some cases, you'll do many others. Can you just reiterate um, the first case against the other cases where, where we originally only had um, nominal being centered at the, the center of your, your chart. Now you can set basically your, your base nominal at a different level, closer to your upper or lower spec limit. Yeah, we would always be able to to set those uh, uh, upper and lower spec limit wherever they come by the process. But the calculation for the CP and CPK need to be adjusted for those changes, which was not, uh, which was not in place, uh, or which we only had one way of calculating CP and CPK, irrespective of where the USL and LSL are and how the process is centered. So now, based on your, uh, your process on your shop floor, you can set your uh, case in which uh, that needs to be used to calculate your CP and CPK, uh, CP and PP, uh, uh, CPK, PP values. Okay. Yeah. On this slide, we've we've got them defined here for you. You've, you've got nominal centered as before. Um, case two is when you've got a upper spec limit only. Uh, case three is when you have a lower spec limit only, <clears throat> only, and case four, you have uh, both spec limits, but your nominal is a bit closer to the LSL. Uh, likewise, case five is has both spec limits, but the nominal is a bit closer to the US. Case six is both spec limits provided. Uh, however, the nominal is equal to the LSL. Um, this is what I equated to on the last page to true position. Um, some, sometimes diameter would be close to one diameter size would be closer to LSL or USL, like in case six or seven. Uh, seen in this screen here, I pointed out a couple of charts, um, and it looks like we could probably see some enhancement to the CPA and PPK values. Uh, without moving the nominal target values, and we'll, we'll set the, uh, we'll change the case number from one to the appropriate case. In which case, um, now uh, case five is what was chosen, and we go back a page and show you the CPK was less than 1.67, the PPK was a little less than 1.67 as well, um, and this feature it was completely negative. And now we're up, up just slightly above 2 on this feature for the CPK and PPK is 2.2. Um, now over here, since we've picked the correct case, we've got a CPK 1.8 and a PPK. Um, now in this, this screen example, we've got a couple of diametric and a link feature. Um, also have some some dire CPK and PPK that are near near zero or slightly below zero, and you know they're at the <clears throat> default case one. By choosing the appropriate case, you know, in this one four for these charts, um, we made these desirable by um, we have nice high PPKs and CPKs in the two point fives and threes. Um, in this case, up all the way up to 5.6. There's some subsequent screens in here that we can ignore for now, but they'll be there for you to download.
So basically, we, we've got it broken out with examples in the PowerPoint for each one of these cases. But we're going to show you in the software some examples. And uh, we did those in the PowerPoint so when we provide it to you later on. You have that for your reference if you're interested. OK. Um, so here are the uh, here is what we were just looking at in one of those first screenshots where we identified it as a problem. It's it's not going to meet our demand, but um, we're going to change it from a case one to a case five scenario. And I've got that saved here in Rule 5 to show you exactly what, what it ended up looking like. How do we use these cases, Tim? Oh, we, um, I'm sorry, I meant, I meant to show that. Um, we just double click on that, on the chart here or right click and say properties, double click within it. And you'll see here there's a drop down by CPK, PPK, how to pick that. Or you can pull up the edit chart page, right, Tegu? Yeah. So based on your business process, you can go to each one of your charts and then change the, uh, the calculation mode for CP and CPK, what case you want to use. Um, Looking at your GDNT or your drawing, you can choose how you want each one of these charts to be um, set for this calculation or which case you want to use. Or you, if you want to do something on a batch mode like these seven features are case and these 20 features are case two, you could use the edit chart page dialog box and uh, there you can set a bunch of active charts and you have an option to change on a batch mode. Uh, for a for a group of charts, what capability, what uh, case of CPCPK calculations that you need to use. So there are a couple of ways of changing this. This is more a little bit of a granular control, but we're getting more and more requests for these type of uh, changes within for the calculation modes, and now with the new version that allows you to do this. Okay. Okay. Now I'm going to show you what the part list wizard is. Um, oops, pardon me. We added a new chart to designate um, a very basic table to give you an index of the number of measurements and their part names. Um, you can also display their date and time. This this helps save a lot of uh, a lot of landscape space on. Uh, rent on the run charts, on the comparator charts, on numerous charts that are graphical in nature, um, but you need to see the part name and number somewhere uh, because those can take up quite a bit of the graphing space for each for each chart. Um, so you might want to uh, might want to take note of this and have one of these. I say maybe page one of your report or or the last page of your report or pep, salt and pepper them throughout when you need them so you don't have to go back 20 pages to find out what the part numbers were. One, um, one comment is that this can be used like a table of contents for the, the samples that you have on your report. If you're showing 10 samples worth of data, think of this as a table of contents for the 10 samples, the name of the, the serial number of the part, the date and time it was measured, uh, for each one of those samples, so you can you can place this chart anywhere in your uh, in your report. So typically, right after the index pages, so it can be like the first graph page, and then followed by the graph pages. So in your graph pages, you can just use the index numbers or the sequence numbers, um, so that if this can be a lookup, if somebody wants to know what is uh, uh, point number seven is, they can look at that up on this chart what serial number it was, what was the date and time it was measured. So it kind of saves a lot of real estate on your graph pages if you can just create an index page of the samples on the first uh, page. 
And for the GDM web users, this could be a big help because you're you're setting up your template. You can use this as one of the pages. And every time they replace the charts from the web, it does use the the serial number and date and time from the web data to populate this chart also. A static chart, it's a replaceable chart based on the data that's populated. Right, you could you could try and fit all those part numbers on run charts and comparator charts and and other types of reporting, but you know it's going to be it's going to be vertical text and it's going to take up a bit of room. So this is this is a very uh, attractive method to to go ahead and see what the contents of those of those serial numbers were and are. Um, you can simply add a page like this by going to the tools menu and hitting the part list chart wizard. And what I'll do is I'll add another page like this. Um, you select from the pull down which which feature you're going to copy these serial numbers from. I already used D1X. I could use it again or I can choose another one like D1Y. Um, I'll go ahead and finally choose which graph page it's going to appear on. So I'll choose a new graph page and then I'll reorder these pages so I can show you how it's more convenient. Okay, there it is on my new page. Okay, now I'm at the beginning of the report. After right after the index page, I've placed a part list. And then I see a couple of graph pages. And then I placed another part list. Just so I don't have to go back to page one to review that every time. And last, you'll definitely want to see where the options for the part list are. There's the part name on and off, the time on and off, and the date on and off, as well as the font and the maximum number of rows to list. Um, in, in, in the, the future, could, I'm, I'm sorry, Jamie. In the future, we, well, the dialog box is up. I want to comment on that. We in the future we'll also have the the percentage inspect for each sample. The number of features and number of values would be columns that you can add on the table. So the table will be more richer with information coming from the samples. We could have the operator name or any other trace fields that's coming from the data field. Uh, this table will be enhanced to, to display that. Right now it has the ability to do the part name, date, time, um, and you have an option to toggle um, any one of those three on or off. Okay. I have a quick question. Okay. Um, I have a quick question about modules. So um, is this for the GDM solid or QDM solid module? Can then this work with uh, GDM or QDM web? Yeah, this one works with QDM web also. So when you create the template, you'll create a page with a part list. and. Um, uh, so that part list, when you upload the template onto the web and you're replacing it with data, this part list chart will refresh with the data that's coming from the web. Yes, it is. Uh, uh, you can set it up as a, uh, as a part of the template and like it will populate the data charts with the new data coming from the web. It will also populate the, uh, the, uh, the part list chart that's with data coming from the web. Uh, we got just two more real fast. Well, we have a second. We're uh, we're doing good on time. So, okay. um, can you please show where the part name is shown on the chart that is used in the part list wizard? So, can you go back to the part list wizard? Yes. And uh, show us where the um, the part name is.
it's the second column here. And then when you're setting it up, can you show us again the, uh, the setup box? So it's under chart settings, options, chart settings, part list chart. This is where the part name is turned on or off. Okay, right at the top there, part name. You can see this column just vanished. Okay. We're turning it off and updating it. So does it show each sample or each feed? The, the part list chart is for the samples. So if you have uh, 10 samples that you loaded, you would see 10 rows of information. You can, because it needs to fit within a page, we have a maximum of 50 samples that you can uh, put on a page. Uh, so, so because that way when you create a template, you might only have five or 10 rows but when you import the data, you can import up to 50 samples and create the uh, update the part list. So the part list is uh, primarily showing the list of samples, not the features. And uh, that's under, one more time, that's under options. Chart settings. Chart settings. And then at the bottom. Last selection there. Yep. Part list chart. Fantastic. All right, that will be good. some. There will be some specific screenshots in the second page of the uh, PowerPoint that they can mull over online there. So let me close that and move on to auto text. But real quick, what auto text is is um, these are designated. Um, labels to attach to the highs and lows of um, the trend chart in the y-axis. Um, we put on the traditional labels of aft for on x-axis, out in for the y-axis, and up down on the z-axis charts. Uh, this is to take the place of a of an older <clears throat> manual method of typing in text one and text two on each individual uh, chart property where you could just kind of label your upper spec limit area and lower spec limit area with whatever whatever the user wanted to customize it as. But this is an automated way of doing that. And just real quick, we're showing the uh, comparator chart settings to enable that. That's shown right here in the green box. And here is a, a page example without with the comparator not showing auto text applied, and now it is applied. And this chart with the gray background, I'm going to magnify that in the, this slide. So you can see this is the y-axis, so we're seeing an out and an in applied to the upper and lower areas. And and one quick comment on this, uh, there's a reason why we called it auto text, I guess, because it only applies to the automotive industry, uh, as well as it's, it's automatically put the text. Because the in, for, aft, uh, in, out, up, down, these are terminologies used in the auto, uh, more on the dimensional area alone. When you're measuring something for x, y, and z values, uh, these are texts that need to be put on the on the charts for for tool for tooling changes. So uh, now we have an ability. Initially, it was manually need to be done. We provided two text boxes where you can type in these values. But now we created this to automatically uh, to apply based on the direction of measurement. If it's x, it'll be uh, from four aft, and if it's y, it'll do the like Jamie showed the details of it. So it primarily, use case-wise, it only applies to the, uh, the uh, automotive uh, dimensional measurements. Um, it doesn't apply to any other attribute type of measurements, but you have an option to switch them off on those cases. Right. And it only applies to X, Y, and Z, so it, it's not going not gonna to make a difference on diameter, length, width, um, custom measurements, and we won't expect anyone in aerospace or other industries to want to use it. So um, here in the run chart auto text, um, the run chart settings menu is showing how 
you turn that on by clicking on the direction. Uh, like the other examples, this is the same report sheet um, <clears throat> where the chart styles are a run chart. Um, it's the auto text isn't applied yet. Then it is applied. Uh, this this chart here with this negative red trend here, I magnify that again for you in this slide. So it's very similar. So basically, you said it's going to be a time saver for if you want to label your your charts um, mm -hmm. according to where your data is, is primarily um, um, aggregating towards either you know upper lower spectrum or whether it's going to specific direction um, dimensionally. Um, so I can, I can see that being useful, um, just as a good reference point, or if you're uh, submitting your chart to a team or uh, another group maybe outside of the dimensional department. Right. I know for me, I like it when you guys label everything, you know, to kind of <laughs> simplify it, because they give me the raw data. I know I, for one, don't exactly know what's going on. Labels help a lot of people, so. Um, can you double click on a chart and show how where the auto text shows up on it? If somebody wants to change that to something else, um, because the the up and down needs something else for an aerospace industry, uh, you have an option to to type what you have high low maybe. Um, That's what I was thinking high low. And then I can um, put that on the Z feature. Or just double click it and type it in the text one or text two. Yeah. So basically the, the, the text one shows up on the top of the chart. Nope. The the uh, something else is refreshing for me wrong. Um, so the text one shows up on the top of this chart and text two shows up on the bottom of the chart. But you have a manual option of changing it to whatever you want, but if you want to apply this automatically throughout the entire report, the auto text is a good option for uh, dimensional measurements. Okay. So if you just put it in manually, can you show? Could you show quickly how to create that into put that into auto text? Is that part of the template? Well, the I think the the configuration the configuration of software hard codes what. Uh, what to put in um, for X, Y, and Z um, when auto text is turned on. Whereas if you're doing it manually, you can make it whatever you want, high and low. Um, what I did here was I incorrectly, on purpose, uh, typed in in and out um, on the wrong axes, on the wrong side of the axes. Because when I flip on auto text, it's going to correct that. It's going to replace. Uh, it should replace this without an in, and this will become up and down automatically. And let's go ahead and um, see if that's the case. We'll go to the chart settings and get our comparator, enable auto text. So that's been changed to up, down, and this was corrected out in because that's that's what the settings are for the comparator chart with auto text turn on. It's going to go through the whole report and and uh, label X, Y, and Z's as defined. Okay. You see you're not going to see anything on diameter. Okay. Um, now I'm going to open Hold on one second here. So can you go back to that, that folder set? Can you show us the folder set of all the, the product functions and productivity? Yes. Of the topics? Can you just blow that up for me? Or make that big. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Control. Scroll a little bit. Okay. No problem. Will that help? All right. So you can see along the top row here. We got our five functions. The final one was our parts list wizard. And then our first productivity enhancement was our auto text to save you some time. So now we're going to be moving into the export Excel CSV, the mouse pane and zoom, the query model, and the index page. I just want to 
make note of what we've already covered. So we started with our audit, our statistics chart, our import match by proximity, which is the import by location, correct? Mm -hmm. And then our capability index, which is that PPK and CPK, right. uh, able to change what, where the, uh, the baseline was. And then, uh, of course, the parts list wizard, great for reference, and to set in your um, to set that up uh, as a nice extra index page or to help you uh, clean up your data. So let's go ahead and keep going. Uh, to export Excel CSV. Don't want to slow us down much. I know everyone's got things to do today. Okay. I just have one last one last thing to go ahead and show on the auto text. Uh, since these are run charts, there's a different, uh, we just wanted to show that switch to throw that on there. And there that is. Hmm. You okay. Apply that to all of your different charts and such. Trend charts and comparator charts. Yeah. All the trend charts. Okay. Yep, just the two trend charts. And um, so let's move mm -hmm. on to exporting the data. Um, let's determine we don't need this. Let's say you want to get um, get your data out into Excel. Um, from the data set after the raw data has been uh, collected from from multiple uh, multiple files, you want to get it out into Excel in one file. Um, we've had a method to export raw data to Excel before. Um, a lot of users haven't been sure which GDM report would be, would give them a full data set or the flavor that they needed. Um, because these are based on different Excel style sheets. So that's kind of mysterious to everyone, including me. But what we did was we put in the export DCS DB2, and now all that is going to come out into one usable master Excel file that's going to give you all that data. And I'll run through that one more time, just real quick. Export DCS DB2. Export DCS DB2 is as simple as it gets. It looks a little funny because it's going ahead and re-imaging all the pages because it exports a, a little picture of each page as well. But ultimately, what it gave us here was uh, a fresh file, at March 14th at 9:59. Can we see what that looks like? And it opens up into Excel and gives you all the information about all the features in the report. Um, it gives you the um, the feature names here with the the part numbers and the date time in this row. Um, we've got the descriptions, we've got the uh, spec limit, the nominal position value, and the, the actual position of the coordinates, along with all the raw data. There's many, many columns in this, but it has all the data. Do we have any questions on this? It looks like that's pretty clear. <clears throat> Do you think you might um, be able to mention quick why the DCS DB2? It's a, it, it's a format that we commonly use within our company so we can communicate between our software products. So DCS DB2 file is a file that we could uh, export out, which is in a easy to read format that you can open up in Excel. You can um, import that back into the GDM web system. So if you want to update any nominals and use this as a nominal file to update the web nominal information, this could be used. The, the other advantage is to be able to uh, a, a direct import into our 3 DCS products where you can uh, take the data from the shop floor and then use it in the simulation. So instead of simulating the data within 3 DCS models, 
you could use the shop floor data to re get real shop floor capability. So DCS DB2 is a is a is a kind of a standard uh, file sharing method between the software tools of DCS. Thank you, Tego. Okay, now I'm going to show you how the uh, we fix one of our views, our view um, tools here. Um, let me go to the last page here and maybe expand my view area of this product. Yep, just give it a second to catch up. Okay, we're trying to let the uh, graphics over webinar settle down here. Yeah, all right, we're good. Um, um, in previous releases of, uh, of the QDM solid, you, um, or even in, you know, authoring the web templates, views were always authored um, using these mouse these mouse click buttons here. <clears throat> um, a, um, a person who's more familiar with a legacy CAD product um, would, you know, sometimes be alarmed that a view they wanted to set wasn't saved for the long term. Um, they just looked at it during the session and they made some mouse gestures like I'm just doing now. Um, so they make their mouse gestures with the three keys on their mouse to move in and out and up down rotating just with the mouse itself and would go on to another page and set another view doing the same method or another and go back to see that their their last page didn't didn't save that view it looked like it did before they touched it um, that is now corrected in the software because um, as I do the mouse gestures um, it simultaneously activates the necessary buttons on the toolbar to save that view. No, no further input is needed by the uh, by the template author to save that view pro properly anymore. So when you're using a 3D uh, CAD information to create your template, uh, you have these five buttons on the top to rotate, pan, zoom. Um, um, and uh, zoom in, zoom out, pan, rotate, and refresh. Um, with just the combination of the keys, uh, if you have a three mouse, uh, um, three button mouse, uh, CAD CAD users are very familiar with just using those three button buttons to uh, to to create whatever orientation that they want. Um, we have incorporated that into the GDM solids now that you don't have to go and put the system in a rotated rotation mode to rotate the part. You can just use the middle mouse key, the roller, to rotate the part, the right mouse key to pan, uh, hold the right mouse key, move up and down. So there are different shortcut keys that are available that without, when you're laying out a 30-page report, you don't have to keep pressing these, uh, uh, activating these different uh, CAD manipulation icons before you do the manipulation. You can go from one page to the other um, and very quickly lay out the all the 30 pages of the report just by using mouse uh, button combinations. So this has been a huge uh, time saver for somebody who's using CAD data to set up their templates and reports and uh, need to get detailed view on each page on different parts of the CAD. Okay. That's fantastic. Actually, we have, um, if you don't mind, we have uh, uh, two questions real quick about our previous, our export to the DCS DB2 file, the, the CSV export. Okay. Um, there's a question, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm personally a little unclear on this. Uh, can you, how do you, can you export deviations that have measured value as a CSV? Now, is that, is that, yeah. So, uh, so there is, uh, the system automatically with the DCS DB2 option exports the the raw data information that's in the in the uh, report 
at any time. But if you want any type of special reports, and that's what Jamie showed, those four report options, if we can go back into the software, just pull up that menu um, for file export, um, any template, file export, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, go to custom reporting format. There are four report options which could be, and that's why we leave them generic enough, so every user might want a different flavor of the export of the DCS DB2 file we can attach, one could be a, a deviation based export of the DB, DCS DB2 file, one could be just the statistics information of the, of the report. So those four reports that you see there could be customized to whatever your needs are, um, but by default the DCS DB2 file exports the raw data as it is inside the system. So if you have a need to do a deviation based export, we can attach that to one of those custom reporting options. Yeah, okay. the, I've, you mentioned the stats. Uh, there is a there's an export, and I think it's I think the default one is uh, GDM report two. It's and this, the stats row. And this it is just one gives, of the it just gives the feature name, the nominal position, the mean, and these and all the stats for it. You know the sigmas, the min max range, the capabilities, and the spec limits. It leaves out the raw data. So this is one flavor of the export, and there could be another flavor which is the DCS DB2 file in a deviation mode. So, okay. Um, just real quick, and um, the part list chart setting instead of part name, could it should say like sample or JSN if you like the JSN number. At, at this time, it's uh, hard-coded to part name to keep it very generic because every different industries use different uh, naming conventions for the part name itself. Uh, it could be serial number, JSN number, VIN number, um, uh, different uh, naming conventions. And we'll in the future, we'll I'll make a note of this and we'll try to make this configurable so you can uh, you can have what applies to your um, your business process. Um, one last question real quick. Um, when looking at the view features, I can use AB and AW to make the view screen larger when wanting to add additional charts and graphics, but it appears that once it grows, it can never return back to an earlier view. So this looks like what, uh, this is uh, a question regarding the mouse moving and changing the, the graphics on your actual charts. When you grow the, the graphic screen, can it be reduced back, return to a smaller, earlier version? When, when you do the auto border AW, it automatically uses the biggest uh, graph page size and makes all the graph pages the same size. The only way to make it smaller would be to uh, uh, would be to make all the graph pages smaller and then apply the auto border again or maybe a better way would be to go to the viewport area and change the change the sizes uh, from the uh, if you can go to the edit button for a minute just to answer the question just to show the dialog box where we can change this if you yeah, click on edit view area um, the the page size the page window size you can make that smaller, and then that will uh, that, and then that will make the uh, make the size uh, smaller. Once it's, well, we will, I will, uh, we will talk to you regarding this and show you these options um, after the after the webinar. Sure. There are a couple of ways of doing it. Okay, um, now I'm ready to show the query model. Um, <clears throat> this is a new productivity enhancement that allows users to create uh, new charts. Um, they're based on the 3D positions of the, the CAD. Um, there's, a, there's a button added to the toolbar called the nominal plan mode, and once that's clicked, that's activated, 
um, you click inside the, the, the window of the product, even if it's slightly off the product, and a box like this comes up for adding a new nominal. Uh, it's going to tell you the exact X, Y, and Z position within the 3D window that, that you clicked on, and uh, you can start creating a measurement. Um, you just give yourself a test, a name. Let me full screen that. Yeah, just can you make it a little bigger? And um, so you can give it a, whatever name you want, uh, type in an area for QDM to use. Um, the attributes X, Y, and Z will automatically be enabled, um, but they're still configurable. Um, some can be, they can be turned off and you can add others like diameter, length, width. Um, you can turn on additional ones like measure and define them. You can even customize all these values, even IJK if, if needed. Um, so you just click in the window and it comes up. Um, in this last screenshot here, what our developer did was actually create that. He, he put in a, a name test, he, cre he left these active, and he added another feature. And he, he turned on the chart type measurement, added it, and this is what he got. He got four, four charts to go with that, with that feature name in half a second, probably. So, so a, a use case for this is basically the ability of the of the QDM 3D software, where you can create a measurement plan. Uh, so once you have your CAD data, and uh, if you would like to create your own measurement points on it, you could click anywhere on the CAD data, and it allows you to create a nominal feature at that location. So you can create a nominal feature and. Uh, create a template for that. So you you have the ability to create your own measurement plans within the uh, within the software. In in the past that you have to load in these nominal information via a file or a nominal uh, a nominal text file or a CMM inspection program to to create features to to create charts for a feature within the square. This allows you to the capability to create, author your own measurement plan, or if you already have a set of features and you just want to add a couple more, uh, this provides you the option to do that within the software tool. Yeah, here I activate the nominal plan mode, and let's say if I want to put a feature on a hole, once I click it, it comes up, and I can go ahead and type Hole one, and I can turn on the diameter. Give it a, give it whatever nominal value I, I think it's going to have. Um, decide what the spec limits are, or if the default plus or minus one is going to be appropriate. and also change the chart type right here. So you, at the end of this process, you created a template to hold those uh, new features charts. I must have hit cancel. Oh, I forgot it went to page one. That's what happened. <laughs> Just a little note there. Uh, new measurements usually go to page one. I forgot that for just a second. There's, there's all the stuff that I was meaning to add. <laughs> you redid it two or three times. I did it a couple of times, yeah. 
but but there's the hole. There's a homely little hole next to it. Okay, and you you see, there's no actual information in those. That's why they're that's why they're great. But this is great for a measurement plan, like Tegu was explaining. You can get ahead of the measurement game by creating the report in advance. So you're basically you're creating all the, the spots you're going to end up measuring, adding data to later. So you're basically putting all your chart placement first and setting up how you're going to want it set up before you even did your first measurement. Right. Yeah, you have the template ready before you even have anything to graph it out. Okay, and um, our feature enhancements on the index page are last. Um, we previously had options just to either hide all the charts on the index pages or show the page numbers plus the uh, feature names on the index pages. Um, seen here, this is the page number where it says 8, and then DX is the feature name with the attribute after it. Um, that was where we were kind of limited to not too long ago. Um, now what we've done is we've added, um, we've added the ability to turn the feature name off or, and uh, do the attribute name only. And what that would look like is this here. Um, in this example, we have the page number and the attribute name only turned on. So we see like 15 X, Y, Z, 15 diameter, 15 length. And instead of worrying what slot, num what slot name that was, we just know we're looking at a, a slot on page 15 with this information here. Um, we also added an index draw shift so that um, so that we can slightly stagger the index charts so they're not all overlapped and look like there's one chart automatically on each page. Because the default would just look like basically one red green box at each location, or you'd have to pull manually, kind of start drawing them off of each other. Uh, by clicking and dragging them over with the mouse. The index draw shift allows you to just get this diagonal automatic um, cant bringing them out of position uh, so you can see what everything that's there at one look. The, uh, the idea is if you're measuring X, Y, and Z on the same location, um, there could be three charts, one on top of each other. With an index draw shift, you can stagger that a little bit, so it will give you give the user the ability to see that there are three charts in that location. Um, you can go as much to really give a big gap between them, but there's a possibility now that can overlap onto another chart. But what we want, the idea is to uh, give it a little staggered look so you, you can see that there is three charts in there or four charts in that location on the index chart. The, uh, the main enhancement is that the ability to initially all your index pages typically just has a box with a number on it which tells you which page the chart is. Now we have added options on there so you can either show just the number, uh, the feature name, the feature name and the attribute name or the attribute name itself or any combination of these three on the index page. So the index page can really become like a road map of the measurement points with feature names and attribute names in it. Yeah, seen on this index page, it, it just it's just a roadmap saying this feature is on page one, this is on page one, this is on page two, this is on page one and three, uh, because the page number only was turned on. Um, if you want to play around with not seeing any of it, then you turn off the page measurement point totally. But for these examples, we're going to leave that on. So you have the choice of having the feature name on. This is sort of the, the last view, and this are sort of uh, some classic options. 
and the new option is to uh, switch from the feature name to the attribute name. So that's only showing the page number and the attribute name. You can have the page number, feature name, and the attribute name. And finally, if you just want to try and see the attribute, sometimes the legend, the indicators around it might squeeze it. But. But this is where how it is with everything just turned on like normal. Okay. Very nice. Is there any questions on the index page? Looks like that was pretty clear. Can you bring up our uh, yep? Can you bring up our list of uh, functions and uh, productivity topics? All right, good. So we went through all five functions and all five productivity enhancements. Um, looks like we've got a looks like we got a couple of minutes now. If we have any uh, Q and A, if anyone has any additional questions or would like something uh, in particular, perhaps on topic here or something similar that they'd like to go over or see, or if they've got a question that's been um, it's been uh, something that might have been troublesome or uh, having trouble finding something within the software. All right, so what I'm going to do at this time is I'm going to go ahead and put us on mute. We did set aside two hours for this just in case there were additional questions at the end or someone wanted a walkthrough on something in particular. So we had a little bit of extra time there. Um, I do know that everyone has a lot to do today, so we don't want to keep you too long. Um, what I'm going to do at this time is I'm going to put us on mute uh, for a couple of minutes, and if you have any additional questions, you can go ahead and send them in, and we'll unmute and answer those and kind of go through a walkthrough. But we will stay here on the line for at least a couple more minutes to give you guys a chance to, uh, to ask any final questions or to go through anything. But um, if you've uh, seen everything that you'd like to see, uh, if you've seen everything that you'd like to see, uh, we will be sending you a recorded version of this webinar training event as well as um, a combined PowerPoint for all of the, uh, the small presentations that he showed you. We had those broken up by function and productivity just for um, to make it easier to uh, sort and uh, navigate but I'll have, compile all those into one um, into one presentation for you just so you could have that for your record all these enhancements are available in GDM QDM solids version 70424 and um, and that is on our FTP site for you to download and uh, we do have an instruction sheet on how to download and install it on your on your PC. Um, we have an instruction sheet that Jamie will send that to you, but uh, it's up on the screen right now. Um, it's uh, it it uh, it shows the steps to um, steps to download it all, um, or to review the what's new on that on that topic. So it's in. If you can check your version number on your current system. Um, and if you need any help, contact our uh, application team, GDM Tech Team, at 3dcs.com, and we'll be help. Uh, we'll be glad to help you download and install it on your system. GDM Tech Team at 3dcs.com. QDM Tech Team works. Oh, too. excellent. QDM Tech Team is even better. <laughs> get it just as fast. And then if you're not sure exactly where your question needs to go, you can go ahead and email me at bbrief at 3dcs.com. I can assist with any FTP issues you have or licensing issues or check to make sure you're under maintenance and uh, get you set up with the latest software. All right, so at this time, I'm going to go ahead and put us on mute and uh, um, we'll go ahead and uh, stay on the line for a couple more minutes. And if you guys have any additional questions, just let us know. We want to make sure that uh, you guys aren't left with any uh, hanging questions or uh, hanging issues 
regarding any of these uh, productivity or functionality enhancements or something related in uh, QDM 3D or GDM solid. So I'm going to mute us at this time. Thank you so much for everyone who uh, is all set and is going to be on their way today. I appreciate you joining us this morning for our webinar training event on QDM and GDM uh, solid and on our new productivity and functionality enhancement. Please take a moment to fill up the survey when you exit the webinar. We just have three very quick questions. We want to make sure that the information we're giving you is useful and is what you're looking for. If there's other, uh, if there's, <laughs> if there's other um, uh, topics you like seeing or like gone over, uh, please go ahead and just let us know. Uh, there was a quick question about whether it's GDM or QDM solid. So let me just clarify that again real quick for you. Um, our product, GDM, is going through a rebranding uh, at this time into QDM. So they're actually the same soft system. Uh, pretty soon, and if you look at our website at this time, you'll see uh, a number of QDM web pages and information. Um, we are adding a lot more enhancements and uh, creating a modular concept for uh, GDM. And so as that process is going through, we're rebranding it to QDM. But everyone who is uh, GDM is under maintenance, you'll get all of those same updates and uh, you won't have your particular system uh, changed with that rebranding. It's kind of as we move forward and add additional customers, uh, we just changed the name to QDM uh, to signify some of the new updates and enhancements that have been added to the software. So thank you very much for your question. If you have any additional ones, just go ahead and send those in. Um, like I said, we will be on the line for a couple more minutes. Thank you so much.